Hey everyone, Bradley Stalder here, bestbellfantasy.com, on Player Profile and Network. I've got a special episode for you tonight. It's a million dollar Best Ball Mania 3 winner. That's King Capital is going to join me in talking about his big million dollar win in the regular season. Best Ball Mania 3 this past year. We're going to talk about the draft board. We're going to talk about his team, draft strategy, zero RB. And we're also going to talk about some big risers and fallers in the underdog best ball streets. So make sure you're checking out today's episode. But before we do, a, ner- a word from our sponsor. Let's take a moment to talk about Underdog Fantasy. Now, many of you have already signed up. Thousands have signed up from Player Profile already over the years. Underdog has supported us since 2020. Much of what you see on Player Profiler is because of Underdog, because of their support. Get the Underdog app, plug in that promo code UNDERWORLD. I used to play Underdog just for the best ball drafts. I mean, the best ball drafts are amazing. These draft rooms fill so quickly, and you can win life-changing money. You want to take advantage of all the sleepers we talk about on this show? Well... What better place than in an underdog draft room to do that? And I recommend taking your underdog play to the next level by diving into their NFL pick'ems. It's important to correlate those NFL pick'ems. You can pick both the quarterbacks and the wide receivers to exceed expectations. Correlate them, and you can 5X your payout. Bada-bing, bada-boom. Underdog Fantasy, the promo code is UNDERWORLD. For an instant deposit match up to $100, underdog is the truest friend of the underworld. And... It's Bradley. It's King Cap. We are here. We're going to be talking some underdog fantasy. King Cap, I am stoked that you are joining me tonight. Thank you so much for carving out a little bit of your evening. We're recording this Monday, July 3rd. It's going to be posted July 4th. So be ready. Be excited. I know some fireworks going off, but I know that this is also going to be a show full of fireworks. King Cap, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. And it might be July 4th, but us sickos don't stop drafting. So thanks for having me on. It's true. <laughs> you know, some of the fireworks shows don't start until like 9, 10 p.m. And, the, you know, you, you've had the barbecue, you've had the drinking. Maybe, you know, I would recommend uh, <laughs> maybe not drinking too much uh, before you draft. Although maybe that's a secret. Yeah. You know, what's your philosophy of drinking while drafting? I'll say this. I'm pretty sure I drafted this team like half asleep. Like I think I was out in the sun and I came back inside and literally was drafting half asleep. So I honestly think don't overthink these drafts. Like, but I am going to be drafting tomorrow. I hope people are drunk, you know, so scoop up some value, but I'm pretty sure I drafted that team half asleep. (laughs) I was just maybe, maybe not the strategy we want to lead into, but that's okay. We are, we're here for the goodness, the good times, Uh, And that means that there's just, it's wide open. I mean, we had what 450,000 people compete in the best ball mania three and you emerged victorious in the regular season. We're going to get into your draft board. We're going to get into your team and all the strategy, but first we're going to talk about some big risers. Uh, The first is the, the biggest riser over the last couple of weeks has been Paris Campbell of the New York Giants wide receiver. Um, Campbell's been getting some running back reps, um, in, which is an interesting wrinkle with Saquon Barkley holding out. And the Athletic has said that Paris Campbell is a featured piece of the offense now and has a strong uh, chemistry already with Daniel Jones, his new quarterback. And, I mean, there's been wide receiver. that We've seen so many wide receivers sign with the New York Giants and Wondell Robinson, Sterling Shepard coming back from injury, Jalen Hyatt's a slow start. Uh, we'll talk about Hyatt in a minute, but Paris Campbell, are you believing that Paris Campbell is the real deal in the New York Giants? Uh, I'm not. I'm sticking with my boy Hyatt. I'm not, you know, falling in into that headline but I know he was trendy last year and he put up a few good weeks maybe it was two years ago I think it was last year and then people got in on him and he uh disappointed so I'm not I'm not buying into him yeah I'm sticking with my boy Hyatt how about you you know I I was getting into some Twitter discussions where I said here are some players that you should not think have the upside that you probably think they do so Players who have too you think have too much upside. And Paris Campbell was one of those players. I mentioned Paris Campbell. I mentioned Donovan Peoples Jones, Romeo Dubs, and I can't remember if there was another one, but all Josh Palmer, those four were the four wide receivers that I said just did not have the upside 
that that uh, fantasy Twitter really wants them to. And I got a lot of pushback on, on Paris Campbell in particular people saying, Oh, well, of course he, you know, he just was on a bad team. He had a lot of opportunity last year. It was just Michael Pittman, you know, Alec Pierce really didn't do much. There wasn't much tight end movement and, uh, Campbell was operating mostly out of the slot. Matt Ryan, just like it was the a dot was so low. He couldn't get past any. He's just not a good wide receiver, despite, you know, good, uh, good metrics. He was a second round pick, but I mean, he just hasn't performed even injuries aside. He still hasn't performed. Yeah. I mean, I have nothing else to say about Paris <laughs> Campbell. I just wouldn't draft him myself. I kind of like Wondell Robinson and uh, my favorite by far is Jalen Hyatt in that uh, wide receiver room. Yeah, Hyatt is one we'll get to in just a bit. But Alexander Madison is our next riser. Um, you know, Kevin O'Connell back at the beginning of June called him a three down back. And we've seen Alexander Madison be a useful piece in this Minnesota offense in the past and spot starts. But I am concerned that Alexander Madison is just a guy. And we've seen Madison, his ADP has risen over the last month or so because of the Dalvin Cook rumors that he would get, that Cook would get cut. And then he finally does get cut. And we've seen Madison go even into the fifth round in some drafts. I can't get behind it. Like, is Madison someone that you're just waiting for the market to like settle on? Or, or what are we going to do with Alexander Madison here? Um, I'm not touching him at all here. I actually was – I have like 40% of him in the pre-draft underdog because he was going like round 11. But at round five or six, I can't – I'm not touching him right now. I will say that, you know, whenever Dalvin Cook got hurt, I mean, we know that he popped off like five times out of six. He would become chalk on DFS and hit. So, I mean, I just – Maybe I should be clicking him, but for now I'm not clicking just because I have so much at a, a much cheaper price, even though it's not best ball mania. I have a few shares back in like the nineties from earlier in best ball mania, but I can't click him here when, yeah. When, you know, yeah. What about he's you? in the fifties and sixties, you know, I probably want to wait until we get closer, maybe the end of July, August, even first week of September, if you're drafting, I think that would be a fine time because by that time the ADP is settled. Like you can get your shares of, of these players where we could have a Leonard Fournette sign in Minnesota. We could have, you know, uh, an Ezekiel Elliott sign in Minnesota. Like you, there's still just so much time. We don't believe that Alexander Madison is anything more than just a guy who has performed. But I also want to push back on, well, he got so many, so many carries like the Minnesota Vikings went from like the 15th pass heaviest under Zimmer to like the third past heaviest under Kevin O'Connell, the, the running game is just a, taken to the back burner. So it could be my boy, Dwayne McBride. I love Dwayne yeah. McBride. He's, he's my boy, uh, King Cap. I don't know if you, fo- if you follow yeah. my love for Dwayne, but <laughs> yeah, I, I do. I see those tweets, <laughs> but, uh, but I think that Dwayne McBride is an interesting eyebrow raised type of player. Uh, Ty Chandler could also sprinkle in. It's just, I, we believe in opportunity. Opportunity is king. And I think opportunity will be clearer when we get to the end yeah. of July, August, September. But we're we're just beginning. We're, it's July 3rd. I'm not buying into Madison right now. Yeah. I mean, you're drafting him. I think he's like pretty much going in the fifth round now, although in sharper rooms, he falls to like the late sixth. But when you're drafting him here, what's the upside? I mean, I can't see him going towards the third round. So but I'm it, it's a potent offense in a really potent division. It's a division I'm targeting heavy, especially the Packers. So I've struggled to find bringbacks, you know, and I like Jordan Addison, but Kyle Pitts goes in that range. JSN goes in that range. So I'm actually struggling to find bringbacks. And so I do find myself clicking Dwayne McBride and also um, a little bit of Ty Chandler. I can't figure it out, but I like your take on Dwayne McBride. He seems like the more polished NFL type back where Chandler's more speedy guy. Yeah, and McBride doesn't need the passing game to be an effective back in this Minnesota offense. Just He's a between-the-tackles type of player. His player profiler comp is Ronald Jones, and if he's Ronald Jones on a Minnesota offense, like a couple years ago, Minnesota Ronald Jones, not like (laughs) 2023 Dallas Cowboys RB3 Ronald Jones, I think that would be at least interesting for fantasy. So, 
but maybe we could talk about a bring back in that game. If you're going Minnesota, maybe we'll bring back with Romeo Dubs. I did mention him as a player that I'm, I'm out on on ADP mostly because I see players like Rondell Moore going behind Romeo Dubs and back at, you know, in May, the athletic believed that Dubs will lead the Packers in receptions. Uh, in the middle of June, a reporter said that Dubs is proving to be Jordan Love's favorite target throughout camp. And I just don't believe that he's going to be a target earner. He wasn't a high draft capital type of wide receiver, but he's getting a lot of love here in the best ball streets over the last couple of weeks. Are you buying into Romeo Dubs? Is he someone that you're actually believing in? I'm not hating on him at the least. I mean, I wouldn't say I'm all over him. He has risen a lot in, in best ball media, like you're saying, but I'm into the Packers like crazy. So I will be taking shares of Romeo Dobbs. But I'm not, like, in love with him. I do think he's, like, a post-hype sleeper, like him and Pacheco. They were some of the biggest hyped-out rookies, and they both kind of fizzled. So I'm in on Pacheco heavy, and I'll be in on Dobbs. I wouldn't say I love him, but I will be in on him. We'll keep moving to – I like Jaden Reed a lot too, though, and Luke Musgrave. So I really – I'm not huge in love with Dobbs because you can get cheaper parts of the passing game much later, but I'm in on Musgrave heavy. So I do like Musgrave late. Um, you know, I do sprinkle in a little bit of craft here and there just in case, <laughs> just in case, you know, like you got your craft cheese, you know, you just sprinkle on here and there, but <laughs> I, I, I <laughs> Musgrave's uh, talented and they put some is. capital into him. So they did. Well, they put third round into craft. Like, it's not yeah. like, you know, they wait until the seventh round to, to put craft in. So I, I do believe that Musgrave is the tight end you want. Uh, but I also am intrigued. Like as a Packers fan, I was like, you got, you drafted guys with pretty redundant skill sets in back-to-back rounds. It, it's at least an eyebrow raise as to what the Packers want to do with their offense. I, I don't, maybe I don't have the optimism that you do here, Cap. I mean, dude, I have 25% love and probably, tw- I know I, I just looked at the quarterbacks today. I'm at 25% love and I'll stay there if not get more. I mean, I'm crazy into the Packers this year, and I'm just into that division as a whole. I think that's a division you want to target big time with the Bears, the Packers, the Lions, the Vikings. These are some potent offenses with somewhat questionable defenses. I agree. (laughs) No, I agree that that's something that uh, from a macro scale, you want to kind of get into these shootouts, not only because – uh, of these teams and their bad defense, but because they meet multiple times, you know, throughout the season. And we talk about the week 17 matchups being the plus EV matchups that you want to be targeting uh, the, the Packers Minnesota Vikings in a dome this year, not in Lambeau field is going to be uh, uh, one that is, I looked at the action networks uh, over under game totals and they were at 44 which is a respectable for week one or for uh, week, 17. week 17, week 17, okay. respectable total. I mean, heck we, we're talking about De- December 31st here. Like we're projecting. it's going to be way higher, but <laughs> 47, 48, I saw the bears because the bears Packers game week one is also 44 and a half. Mm. So I thought maybe you were talking about that one. It's funny how they're the same. I think they're both too low. I don't know about you. It's going to be interesting. I, I would probably take the over on that. The the defenses could be could be real rocky at the beginning. And and we've seen like one big play from Christian Watson, one big run from Justin Fields, and and we're we're on the board for 14 already. We'll keep it moving with San Francisco. There's gonna be a lot of San Francisco talk here in the next couple of minutes because Brandon Ayuk, Christian McCaffrey, and Brock Purdy go four, six, and seven as the next biggest risers. Uh, Ayuk has gotten steady reports from multiple sources saying that he's due for a big year. Um, obviously, this is also tied to the potential of Brock Purdy, who's mostly a pocket quarterback, going to be able to get him the ball. Uh, Ayuk seems to be the the prime wide receiver. Like obviously, Debo is a do it all man. He can run, he can catch yards yards after catch machine. But Brandon Ayuk is that outside wide receiver that if Purdy is going to be the quarterback, we've seen what Purdy can do. He put up a four touchdown passing game, you know, at the end of last season. 
Um, so this is a this is an offense that I think you can get pretty cheap, like Ayuk, uh, round five, round six, probably. Uh, Christian McCaffrey, you're going to have to pay up for, but Brock Purdy was going as quarterback twenty five, you know, yeah, as of like a week ago. So he's definitely going to be a riser. I do like the the uh, the Forty ers a lot. I like Debo a lot. I, he was going around eighteen last year. Now he's going about thirty two. I think just in best ball, he's better than in start sit because he can have massive ceilings. And he said the other week that he's never going to put up the kind of numbers he put up last year again. So. He is really motivated to have a better season. I like Ayuk in the 58 to 60 range at, at 52 to 50. I don't see him rising more. So I think if you wait it out, he'll fall a bit more. But I like, I mean, these are people you want to have in your lineups because of the ceilings. And I like Elijah Mitchell a lot at 125. I mean, he is contingent upside and can go off even if CMC is healthy. And just the leverage, if, if CMC gets hurt, that's, a ton of lineups dead and now you have Elijah Mitchell in the 12th round. Yeah. Maybe that's a handcuff scenario too, that like maybe because I don't know what is your philosophy of handcuffs? Because I've had some people come on and say, I'm not going to handcuff. Like I'm just going with my guy. And some people are like, Oh, that might make me unique because other people will just be drafting McCaffrey and I might be able to get through one round with McCaffrey, and then maybe he gets hurt, and then the other round, it's Elijah Mitchell will get me there. I'm big on certain offenses, the 49ers being one of them, the Falcons being another one, and the Eagles being another one where you can get both running backs, and they can both go off the same week. You know, So I'm not handcuffing these dudes. Like If CMC gets hurt, then Mitchell will go off. I'm doing it because I think the same game, they can both pop off, and it'll be unique. Uh, you, know. you you indirectly mentioned Tyler Algier, who's one of my favorite uh, contingent upside run. Like everyone, like Bijan Robinson is like the bee's knees, you know, in drafts. He's not someone I've been clicking a lot in the first round, but like if he falls in the second round, I've been clicking because, you know, sure. But Tyler Algier, he's not only got the contingents upside, he's actually good at football. Like he was the number one PFF graded running back, rushing running back from over the last six weeks, this he's a good player. Yeah, and his contingent upside is insane. I have about 36% of him so far in Best Ball Mania, so I'll be drafting him whenever possible. I really like him a lot. <laughs> I love Tyler Algier. I think it's just an amazing, cheap uh, leverage play. Absolutely. With Also, he can go off if Bijan's you know, still healthy. We don't know what Arthur Smith's going to do. He always has tricks up his sleeve. <laughs> it's possible that like Bijan gets 18 rushes and Tyler Algeo gets 12 and both of them are fantasy viable. Yeah, no, definitely. And I mean, when he, if Bijan goes out, Algier is a fourth, fifth round pick at max. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. I'm here for all the Algier love. Uh, we'll keep it in the running back room. Kenneth Gainwell, uh, is the fifth highest riser over the last few weeks. I think this is just the market correcting itself after he fell so much post DeAndre Swift trade. So I, I don't think there's any real news to say here other than Kenny Gainwell is jumping up a little bit. I don't think he's a, like a touchdown scorer. He's more of a PPR. Like if you're in like a best ball for for drafters or a best ball for FFPC. Maybe he's more of a consideration in the PPR realm because that's his skill set. But I think DeAndre Swift is better than Kenny Gainwell at receiving. And and DeAndre Swift is also better at rushing than Rashad Penny. So I, I, I'm i big into DeAndre Swift at his price point in the mid-sixth round. Kenny Gainwell, like, fine, I'll rotate through. But I'm not, like, going out of my way to draft Kenny Gainwell. I'm definitely not either. Uh, maybe I should be because I'm, you know, I learned from my team that I always leave a draft with the Eagles running back. You know, I wouldn't have won without Miles Sanders. So I'm definitely, they're all cheap again. I would, I mean, you can take all three, honestly. They're so cheap, all three of them. I'm, maybe I should be taking more Gainwell than I am, but I, I love Penny. I love Swift. I haven't drafted any Gainwell yet, but I think I might. Because he's just so cheap, and that's that's an offense you really want to get pieces of, for sure. The like the we we'll talk like on a macro scale when we get to the your team and 
the the offenses that you targeted and how that worked out. But I agree with you that looking at from like a team perspective, it's important to be targeting the right teams and the right environments. I mean, the best will mania three, four teams are are focused primarily because so much EV is happening in week 17 that you're focused on, you know, stacking and, and the right game environments. But, you know, your your win was season long. So I, I don't want to prolong that too much. We'll get to that here. We've talked about McCaffrey briefly. We've talked about Brock Purdy. Brock Purdy is expected to be starting week one. I think he should be an auto click for us in when he's in the quarterback 20s. Um, I mean, look, whoever is going to be the San Francisco 49ers quarterback is going to be fantasy relevant. Uh, it, he, Shanahan creates the offense to get the ball out of the quarterback's hands into the Debo's into the Ayuk's and Kittles and, and, uh, and Christian McCaffrey's. So Brock Purdy should be an auto click. I know. And, and they, their offense is incredible. And mostly in the second half, like I remember the Seahawks playoff game where Brock Purdy basically broke the slate with like 48 fantasy points or something. And most of it came in the second half after they wear the defense down. So, I mean, where, where he's going is ridiculous and he'll definitely be a riser. And I really like Debo at his price and fading the sentiment. So I, I love Brock Purdy. All right. We'll shift gears here to the biggest fallers and then cap. We will get to your team. I know we've, we dragged the listeners on long enough, uh, but, but, your boy, Jalen Hyatt, here is the biggest faller over the last few weeks. And that's been because of the, the chatter out of camp that he's operating with the third team. And that's the report from The Athletic on June 16th. Uh, supposedly, there are big adjustments from this Tennessee offense and his limited route tree. But there was also some mock drafts coming out. Uh, right before the draft, maybe a couple weeks before, where Jalen Hyatt was being mocked as a back and first round pick wide receiver. He ended up falling to the third round. But I mean, the Giants don't need Hyatt to be Jackson Smith and Jigba. They just need him to be a deep threat, maybe to beat out Darius Slayton, which wouldn't be too difficult to do in the deep threat realm. So I think this is a week 17 type of target guy, maybe not a season long target, but a week 17 stack possibility. Jalen Hyatt. What do you think? Yeah, I really like that game. I like the giants Rams game a lot. I think the Rams will be a bit better, but that could be a game where their seasons are over and they're slinging out the rookies. I mean, at this, I've been heavy invested in Hyatt. Thankfully I don't have too many best ball manias in yet because I was buying him at the one forties and now he's, you know, the one eighties. But at this price, I mean, you don't need him to go off until the end of the, the season, like you're saying. And the, the two, Jalen Tolbert fell a ton last year as a rookie, but also Christian Watson and Garrett Wilson fell a ton. Garrett Wilson fell like 30 picks from his starting position, and Christian Watson fell like 60. You know, so two, they probably smashed the hardest. I mean, Olave, you know, he's, he's going crazy now ADP-wise, but I would say that Watson and – Garrett Wilson were the biggest smashes last year and they were the two of the three biggest fallers. So I'm not worried at all about Hyatt. I'm very thankful he's going so cheap. And I agree with you that that's a week 17 game to target. And, you know, we definitely better best ball player because he just has a crazy high ceiling. Like, honestly, <laughs> you know, and I mean, they, he traded up to get him. So, yeah, I, and I think he had 19 yards per reception in college. Like this is a deep threat, uh, speed guy, four, four speed. Um, so I'm, I'm in on that. You mentioned the Rams defense being bad and them probably putting out some rookies. I mean, it's already been trending that the Rams have one of the best, one of the worst defenses in the NFL aside yeah. from out of anyone. I mean, even include Aaron Donald in that and they're still atrocious. So I'm here for Jalen Hyatt development, beating out eventually Darius Slayton. You mentioned that there are day two rookies that these are rookies who tend to hit anyways near the end of the season. Like that's just the development of a rookie over the course of the year. So uh, look, both King Cap and I are in on Jalen yeah. Hyatt. And one more thing about Hyatt. Yeah. Uh, I've done a lot of research into him. You know, he didn't really break out until midway through his junior year, and it took an injury from the wide receiver one, Cedric Tillman, for him to break out. So he really works hard. 
you know, and he was basically you know, doubted in college and almost didn't break out if it wasn't for the Cedric Tillman injury. And now he's being doubted again. I've done a fair amount of research into him going back to high school and the dude works really hard. So, you know, aside from football, this is a guy that is going to not slack off when it comes to working. And I mean, yeah, I'm very bullish on him. And I think he's going to be a smash come the playoffs. <laughs> Woo, we are here for all the Jalen Hyatt love. All right. Uh, the second biggest faller over the last couple weeks is Tyreek Hill. And that's stemming out of the, yeah, the investigation regarding the Miami Beach Marina employee. Police confirmed at the end of June that the victim will press chargers. There might be a suspension. Uh, like, is this a player that you're just you're avoiding entirely, or is this, I'm waiting for the discount, seeing what happens just like the Tyreek Hill incident from a couple years ago. Like there were some people getting Tyreek Hill in round four, round five, like, I don't know. It was, it was wild. And then he ends up not even being suspended. I I don't know about you, but I'm just waiting and seeing what value I can get for Tyreek Hill or just clicking him anyways in the first round. Yeah. If Cooper cup's gone, then I'll still click him. Like he, he falls beyond Cooper cup now, but he doesn't fall too far. Uh, I saw someone say that like it, he wants to know if there's a video out about the incident because it seems like that's the big thing the NFL mm-hmm. cares about as soon as there's a video released of the assault, which, I mean, it doesn't even seem like it's a bad assault for Tyreek Hill. I still will take him once Cooper Cup's gone, you know, but I do have Cooper Cup over him and I've had him since the beginning, but now it seems like Cooper Cup is, is, is ahead of Hill. I mean, we've seen the Alvin Kamara video and the NFL still hasn't suspended him yet over over that incident. So I maybe it's not even the video, too. Like, <laughs> like we don't even if, if, come on, NFL, like at least be. I agree with you. Yeah. The NFL and he said usually he's going to retire in like two or three years. So, I mean, I don't yeah, know. If I'm buying him in that, dynasty but... anyways, like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I got him for Matthew Stafford straight up in the super flex. Call me, call me stupid, impressive. but, but I, I, you know, that just happened this past week. So, I mean, I, that's crazy. I just picked him in like the 14th round in a dynasty startup like yesterday. So I can't believe that you got him for Tyreek Hill. I mean, you traded him for Tyreek Hill. Yeah, that's uh there we go. So, all right, Tyree Kill, a big faller. Wondell Robinson, also a big faller. You know, Obviously, he had the ACL tear last year. It was mid-season, which is never a good time to have an ACL tear. Like you either want to have it right at the end of the season where you know you're probably not going to be, you know, starting until maybe the end of the year or, you know, have it right at the beginning or in training camp so that you have the full year to recover. It's going to be interesting to see when Wandell actually does, you know, become active. He's falling partly I think because of the Paris Campbell news that he's getting positive buzz that they're also in the same slot role like New York Giants decided to sign all of the slot receivers James a Crowder even showed up like <laughs> uh but Wandell and Wandell Robinson and Sterling Shepard are top uh physically unable to perform list candidates to start the season so maybe that's why he's falling as well there's just the 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 light is being shined upon the fact that he may not start the season. Yeah. And when I watch shows, I don't even think you hear his name mentioned. It's always Slayton, Paris Campbell, Isaiah Hodgins, Jalen Hyatt. I I don't even hear people talk about him. So that could be another reason why he's falling, but it's such a, it's a roulette wheel. Who's going to, you know, go off in this lineup, but I do like Wanda Robinson. I, I would say he's my second or third favorite. I mean, definitely more than Slayton and Paris Campbell. I like Wandale. I, I wish he wasn't coming off the ACL because he would have been my favorite piece of this New York Giants offense coming into his second year. I was big into him coming out of uh, Kentucky. I thought that he was going to really take the Giants by storm out of the slot. Um, I thought that he was going to be a better version of Rondell Moore. And, uh, and unfortunately, suffering the ACL tear, uh, I think, has derailed that dream a little bit. But... We'll see what happens with Wandell. Uh, maybe once again, another week 17 consideration if the price is right, given how we feel about the Rams defense. Yeah, uh, it's a ton of good picks at the end. It's it's honestly hard to separate. And that's why I like underdog more than DraftKings, because in DraftKings you have 20. So it gives 
people more luck. Like they don't, it's the skill of 18 rounds is much more because you have to choose which of these late guys you want. There's so many of them this year. Yeah. There's a lot of players that I'm just rotating through. Like, honestly, like I like this player. I like this player. Like, Oh, who fits with the stack or who can be correlated or, or maybe I just taken off, you know, Deontay Harty, you know, like <laughs> Dude, there's so many. <laughs> <laughs> uh the the fourth part of this faller and then we got trey lance to 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 wind us down here deandre hopkins is our fourth far, farthest faller say that four times fast um deandre <laughs> hopkins i think this is just a, a post hype cool down there's a lot of rumblings about him going to new england or tennessee and not Buffalo or Kansas City, there was a little bit of hope that maybe it would want to be one of those big time offenses. But unfortunately, Hopkins looks to be going to offenses that we're not super excited about. But he did command massive target shares in Arizona last year. So you can't like ignore DeAndre Hopkins. I think he's fine as a fourth round pick, but I don't know. Is do you see his ADP rising at all if he signs with New England or Tennessee? No, but maybe it should more than the other places because, you know, they're bad and he'll command targets. I take him when he falls to like 50, but otherwise I prefer like London and and uh, people. I, I, I probably should be clicking him more than I am, but I definitely have a, a bias against old people as my lineup showed. But so he, <laughs> he's not attractive. He's not a sexy pick. That could be another reason why he's falling. Um, I have a bias against old people. I love it. <laughs> It definitely dude. <laughs> the ageism the ageism shines forth in the best ball streets <laughs> take that to the bank kids uh, <laughs> all right so hopkins you know we'll we'll consider hopkins at that four or five turn trey lance obviously as uh what goes up must come down and if brock purdy is trending trey lance has to be trending down and uh and i think that that's all we really need to say about trey lance other than well, uh, June 21st, Adam Schefter did say that Sam Darnold has the edge over Trey Lance going into camp. Uh, Sam Darnold is just bad, though. So this maybe that's even worse news for Trey Lance. Dude, that is ridiculous. I saw one beat reporter said he's like the best. He has the best throwing uh, passes of any 49ers quarterback they've ever seen. Some beat reporter said that for the 49ers. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> Uh, it's sad, man. What the, what happened? To I, maybe they're taking some drugs over in uh over in yeah. San Fran, dude. Honestly, and <laughs> I, it's just sad. I can barely talk about Trey Lance. It makes me so sad. Uh, <laughs> that's all right. At least he didn't show up on your team. Um, but yeah. that will bring to a close our biggest risers and fallers. Make sure you guys are uh, are checking out Player Profiler because there's a lot of great information coming out. Uh, from that Twitter handle, Jack Cavanaugh runs it. He does an excellent job. Um, make sure you guys are subscribed on Twitter at Roto Underworld. We're gonna jump in King Cap to uh, your team. We're gonna I'm gonna pull up. Here we go. Get, get rid of this. We're gonna do this. There we go. Look at that. We've got some fanciness out here. Yeah, so dude. this is. Uh, King Capitals, big winning team, most points in the regular season. This one, you a million dollars. Uh, before we get into the team, what's one thing you did with that million dollars there, King Cap? Well, I went to the Bills game where DeMar Hamlin uh, got smoked. And oh, wow. Actually, it's pretty crazy because before the tackle, T. Higgins, he looked like he was straight out of a video game when you're driving a car too fast and they show the lines behind it. Like, my friend and I looked at each other like, holy smokes, T. Higgins a beast. And that's before the tackle. So, T. Higgins is a monster. I went there. I went to Vegas. I've traveled a fair amount, and I've just been chilling, really. Uh, invested some of it. I've been chilling. <laughs> <laughs> well, you started out with Devontae Adams at the 110, and it seemed like Adams was – going about there that didn't seem like it was a big fall but he really performed in some of his spike weeks he really went off he disappeared in some of his games this year more than in previous seasons with Aaron Rodgers but Adams at the 110 um was that a player that you were targeting or he just came to you at that at that spot I mean dude I told you at the beginning of the show like I was half asleep when I drafted this team and so I clicked him I have a bias against old people I was not in on Devontae Adams or Travis Kelsey. And that's why I'm saying, like, draft half asleep. If you really – if you draft a lot, 
because you have the the board memorized the back of your head you have right. all the strategies if you're just drafting once or twice i mean definitely don't draft half asleep but <laughs> no i mean dude i don't know if i would have clicked him if i wasn't tired so i was definitely not in on Devonte adams or travis kelsey <laughs> well, I mean, for Kelsey to fall to the 203 is, you know, pretty wild given that, yeah, I mean, I took him at the one, two turn in one of my uh, expert leagues last year, um, CD lamb and Travis Kelsey for him to go to the 203. It seems like he fell a little bit. I know that, you know, it, it's hard to like stack with Mahomes, but Mahomes is going mid third round last year as well. So, uh, you do have a thing against old people, but I mean, Kelsey at that spot set up pretty nice. Yeah. I just, I was following ADP this draft. And then AJ Brown in the third round at the 310. So you've set yourself up. You've got, you went wide receiver, tight end, wide receiver. And then you actually rattled off four out of the first five picks were wide receivers. At that point, were you thinking, you know, all right, I've gone these wide receivers. Am I just going to keep pushing? running back or was it in your mind like no i maybe i need to be considering some players here um no i was not focused on running back i was really enjoying going zero rb and the more you the later you push uh the running back like seventh or eighth round the more upside your team has because very little people are going zero rb and then even less people are pushing it so you really want to push zero rb as far as you can really so I was deciding between Hertz and Brown at the five six turn, and I went Amon Ra because his ADP was was higher. But I really wanted Hertz, so I was like very close to going Hertz first. And I do believe it's because I was tired that I picked Amon Ra first, and then luckily Jalen Hurts fell to me. But if I had selected Hertz first in the next three picks, Amon Ra would have gone. So I did draft this in mid July, and AJ Brown rose a fair amount. Uh, Amon Ra rose a fair amount too. So in those, those two picks would not be possible in August, AJ Brown and Amon Ra on this team. Yeah. There are pluses and minuses to drafting, you know, at the, in in August or even the first week of September, you have more knowledge. Obviously there's clearer roles, but you do lose the ADP values that like the closing line value differential is going to be much more significant. If you're drafting, you know, uh, now versus you know in in august september so i agree with you there there are some values you also fell into a stack like jalen hurts aj brown and i know that hurts was on your mind at that point was it because of the stack or because of jalen hurts as the player yeah i mean just because aj brown came there like i obviously liked hurts as a runner i mean i thought he was really cheap kind of like justin fields this year but the, I saw what Diggs did to Buffalo and Josh Allen, so I kind of thought the same thing was going to happen with A.J. Brown to Jalen Hurts. So I was very in on Jalen Hurts and wanted him badly at the 5-6 turn. But I just went disciplined and took Amon Ra first, <laughs> you know. And and um, I had something else to say. I'll let you know when it comes back to me. That's okay. The next one is going to be a pretty natural question, and maybe this is – this is what I think, and maybe correct me if you're, you think I'm wrong, but I think that what differentiated your team from the field was that you clicked both Jalen Hurts and Joe Burrow. That I, I put a video out last year essentially saying, like, who are you going to pick at about this spot in the sixth, seventh round? Are you going to be picking Jalen Hurts or Joe Burrow? And you said both, essentially. Now, what talk us through what was the reason you took Joe Burrow? Uh, he fell like 12 picks past ADP, so I was like, This is pretty unique, I'm just gonna take him, you know. And then he went off for 40 points during Jalen Hurts' bye week. So, I mean, the reason I took him was because he was well past ADP. And I saw, I think Chess Liam like called out my team and said it's not sharp because I didn't go Tyler Boyd you know, and didn't stack Joe Burrow for the playoff week. So I thought that was hilarious. But yeah, it's <laughs> Joe Burrow because he fell fast ADP. <laughs> Just <laughs> Liam. Shout out. Shout out Just Liam. Uh, Best <laughs> Mania 2 winner, uh, Just Liam. Uh, but Miles Sanders there was your first running back in the eighth round. And this also correlated with your previous picks of Philadelphia quarterback Jalen Hurts and A.J. Brown. Was Miles Sanders the target 
or was it just he also fell to ADP? What was the thought behind selecting Miles Sanders at that spot? Well, I had A.J. Brown and Jalen Hurts, so I thought add another eagle. I was also big into Miles Sanders because he told people, don't draft me in fantasy. And people yes. had been by him for like three years straight. And I really target like when people get tired of a player, kind of like Debo Samuel this year. People are getting tired of him. So I like to fade sentiment, and he seemed like a really prime target to – to bounce back and it was really just tight end i mean touchdown regression that people were pissed off at so when he said don't draft me a fantasy i wanted to draft him you know i only ended up with like four percent of him though even though i really liked him which there must have been somebody else in that range that i was taking yeah king cap uh advises all the fantasy players don't listen to the nfl players when they talk about fantasy like for real (laughs) <laughs> yeah in the coaches i remember uh sirianni he came into one of the first press conferences of the summer early august with the kenneth gainwell sweatshirt and then i was like oh my god like i don't have enough kenneth gainwell there's another running back i was drafted in that range and you know look how that happened he didn't do anything that season so really avoid the news in the summer and you oh yeah you said something about uh like it's hard to get a read but i it was very clear to me that Damian Pierce was going to be like the workhorse back. Mm. And I think it was because the backup was like pretty bad. Rex Burkhead. Rex Burkhead. And and there was another one too, but there was, Ogumba Wale. Yeah, they were all awful. And so it was like very obvious that Damian Pierce was the, was the lead back. And so the market's pretty slow to adjust the same with Alexander Madison a few months ago, and even the beginning of best ball mania. So there are times where like, it's very obvious that there's going to be a workhorse going cheap. I, I would say that it, like Miles Sanders, Chuba Hubbard's a very good running back. So, you know, if the backup is good, then be wary. But if the backup's not good, hammer the guy that's cheap. Is there one this year that you think is fitting that description? Or are you still waiting to uh, to get a better read? Let's see. I mean... Because I've got one in mind. I don't know what round you're thinking, but Damian Pierce is going in like the 12th, 13th round. I'm big into all the rookie running backs, like Roshan Johnson, pretty much everyone. That was the name I was thinking of, Roshan Johnson. Yeah, dude. I'm big in – I have like 40% right now. (laughs) Let's go. (laughs) Let's go. (laughs) That is such an on-brand thing for player profiler people. So, Roshan Johnson, you heard it. Yeah. No, honestly. Uh I'm into a bunch of the running backs in that range, you know, and a bit earlier, uh, James Conner, even a bit earlier, Cam Akers, a lot of these dudes. I think that, you know, people are talking about these third round running backs because of the increased prices of the wide receivers, but there's even more value later, you know, I mean, they could be great values in the third round. They obviously appear so, but there's also great values in the seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th round because of these wide receivers being pushed up oh yeah cam Akers is one of my favorites to be clicking i I think he's this year's josh jacobs i think there's a lot of post hype on cam Akers, former second round pick um who had been given pretty heavy workloads before that achilles injury and and then he somehow talked his he weaseled his way back into the rams lineup at the end of last season so um (laughs) we're popped off absolutely he did um we'll keep it going here you you somehow speaking of weaseling you somehow got a top 10 pick in garrett wilson at the back end of the ninth round i mean this there's no way that a top 10 wide receiver in the nfl draft would be going that late like in 2023 but but here we are looking back at this draft like (laughs) But were people just afraid of like the Zach Wilson effect? Yeah, people were definitely afraid of the Zach Wilson effect. There was also some stuff where he was working with the second team and playing a lot of snaps in the preseason, kind of like the Jalen Hyatt stuff. He was falling all season and he fell another like 15 spots past where I took him. He was going at like 122 by the end of the year and I picked him at the 910. I don't know what pick that is number wise, but I, I, he, I got negative CLV on Garrett Wilson, but I was trying to reach for him because it was so obvious how good he was. Yeah. Another thing that's funny is that Elijah Moore was like the really sexy pick and everyone's favorite wide receiver last year. And Garrett Wilson just ate his lunch. So there, I, I see a few 
places this year where some, one guy's getting hyped and maybe the other guy's going to eat his lunch. But people got burned hard on on their favorite wide receiver, Elijah Moore. You know, and also yeah. Kenneth Walker, yeah. I was big on him, like very big on Kenneth Walker, and they played each other week 17. So I really tried to, you know, get one so I could get the other. Well, and you rattled off three straight rookie running backs. You went Kenny Walker, you went Rashad White, and Damian Pierce. Pierce was the highest scorer or contributor for your team out of all three. Pierce was getting, I, I actually, uh, I was doing projections today, and I looked back, his median rush share was 83% of the rushes. Like, he had not just a stranglehold, but bell cow back level. Um I mean, the, the Texans signed Devin Singletary. I still believe that Damian Pierce is going to be, I don't know if it's going to be 83%, but I don't think Devin Singletary brings that number down significantly. Honestly, and I'm pretty bullish on that offense, and they need to win now with their draft moves <laughs> where they basically traded next year's first round for this year. So they need to win. They're not getting a, a cheap pick, next, a good pick next year. So I'm I'm actually really in on the Texans. So I need to be clicking more Pierce. I go wide receiver or tight end around that range. I think Pitts goes yeah. there. There's a lot of good picks there. So I don't get much Damian Pierce because of Kyle Pitts, because of some other people. But I need to get more of him. Cause I'm def I agree with you. He's gonna get a big workload unless he gets hurt. And I think it's the offense you want to target. Now, after that, you went uh, Nico Collins. It didn't contribute a lot for your team, but, I mean, you stacked him later with Davis Mills, who didn't contribute at all. <laughs> I mean, but, but you had Jalen Hurts and Joe Burrow. Like, are you looking back at your team and saying, okay, Davis Mills, last round, like, maybe I should have gone with – I should have just gone with my two quarterbacks and said, you know, I'm these are the two I'm rolling with, and there's no – my team is in trouble, essentially, if – Davis Mills is the one scoring points for, for me with Jalen Hurts and Joe Burrow. or, or like well, I, my, my thinking was sneak him into the finals, and then I mm. stacked heavy the Texans-Jaguars game. So yeah. the whole reason I took him was not so he gave me points, but that I snuck him in. And then, like, the long shot that he's the top scorer, no one's going to have this dude. And so I stacked heavy the, the Houston-Jags game, and I would not have gotten to the Jags if I didn't have Damian Pierce and Nico Collins. And I was big on Nico Collins – last year and I was following him all year because the more the season went on I noticed this team was looking very good and he was going off on all the advanced analytics so he's he's one of the biggest risers in, in best ball mania and I think he'll continue to rise pretty hard so I would target him at this range uh but yeah I mean I wouldn't have gotten to the Jags if I didn't get Damian Pierce and Nico Collins and again my whole reasoning for Davis Mills was to sneak him into the to the finals which I think you have to think about best ball as in winning a tournament. And just as much as you focus on the players, focus on the theory of trying to win the three mil, you know? So I just tried to sneak him in. Another pick I might've wanted to go is Samaj P. Ryan. Cause I went the other Bengals backup and P. Ryan smashed. Yeah. So I think if I had P. Ryan instead of Evans, I would have won by like 150 points. I mean, the, <laughs> the, Evans was the the player though that everyone was in on because not only was he the pass catching back because he had that as his profile, but it was also that Chris Evans was a really good pass blocker. And but we look at the PFF data from 2022, Samaj P. Ryan actually became the best pass blocker. He became one of the better receivers. Like. Credit where credit's due. Samaje P. Ryan did what he needed to do to be the running back two on this Bengals team. And uh, there wasn't a lot of rumblings to say that Samaje P. Ryan had improved. So we were just going with, oh, if there's a guy who goes down, Ev we want pieces of the Cincinnati offense. And Evans profiles as this pass catcher who can pass block. Maybe he can play third downs. That could be interesting. But no, it was pretty much just Joe Mixon who ended up having, I think, like a median, like 12% target share. It was ridiculous. But P. Ryan, uh, yeah, that would have that would have really gotten gotten your team. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. I wonder what you think about Joe Mixon. Because he's he's pretty cheap this year, but I mean I don't think he really went off last year at all. So he is cheap. And but I don't I don't really see him as a good pick, like a trap value. I don't know what you think of Mixon. So he's one of those players that I looked at the expected points scored, 
and his actual points scored. And he was one of the most disappointing players from last year. He was just given so much opportunity, so many goal line carries and his, he had all uh, the highest expected fantasy points, the highest 84th percentile game scores, like expected uh, game scores. This was a player that if he's still on the Bengals, like it's just regression at that point that, He's going to, I mean, Samaji P Ryan's gone and it's not Chris Evans. We know that the Bengals aren't big on Chris Evans. So I think that, I think that Joe Mixon is actually a post hype sleeper, if anything, like at at that spot, because of his role, we know the Bengals could have moved off of him at the draft. They could have cut him and maybe they still can, but at this point there, the opportunity is there. He's not, he's not, fallen off the age cliff like the Dalvin cooks or, or the Alvin Kamara's like we've seen them lose significant efficiency. I think it's just that Joe Mixon got unlucky for most of the games and he did have his one five touchdown game that won some DFS people massive amounts of money, but um, he overall was a fantasy loser last year because he just didn't return on what we expected from him. Yeah. I mean, that's very interesting what you said. I'm, I'm appreciate you. I'm still not going to draft much of him because of the other players in that range, but he's probably going to rise in value. So, yeah. And so I, maybe now is the time to get a couple shares of him, especially because, you know, once we get into August and and early September, uh, look, we, we will know, we will have the information. And by that point, I mean, Joe Mixon could be up to the third round. Yeah. Like, so. Uh, yeah, that's that's what I'm thinking with him. Yeah, the Najee Harris type range. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, let's see. You you drafted Khalil Herbert, who had an over number one overall running back week one of the weeks. Uh, that was a nice little pick. Was it just I needed another running back for Khalil Herbert in round fourteen? Um, well, he also played the Lions, and that was mm-hmm. a game week seventeen, and that was a game I was targeting heavy. So I went. Uh, you know, Amon Ross St. Brown, Khalil Herbert. And I think what this team exemplifies is like one of the real benefits of zero RB, which none of these players really smashed all season long, but they just bounced off each other. Like there was a few weeks where Herbert went off. There was a few weeks where Damian Pierce went off. There was a fair amount of weeks where Kenneth Walker went off and they all just ping ponged at the right times. And that's one of the benefits of zero RB is that when you get into the playoffs, you have six or seven running backs that one could fall into great value that week that no one has. Whereas if you go early RB, you're going to end up with, you know, maybe five running backs. And if the running back you picked early goes off, everyone's going to have him. So he he doesn't become someone that's going to help you win. He just needs to go off so you don't lose. So there's a lot of benefits of zero RB, and my lineup exemplifies one, which is that you can just fall into a week where you get a running back in the playoffs that not many people have and will go off. While you have a running wide receiver in the place of the running back that other people took, playing in the ping pong game is one that uh, it's an art sometimes, but there's also a science to it. You do want to have the correlation, you do want to have players where there's a little bit of ambiguity. Like Kenneth Walker had, I don't know if we knew at this point, but he had the the injury, the uh, what is it, not the groin injury, he had a um, hernia injury in the preseason. You know, and he didn't play the first couple games and or the first game and he was eased in and you, there was ambiguity about Damian Pierce because his Pierce actually good. And I wrote that he wasn't actually a good player, but he got so much opportunity that it was worth it to draft Damian Pierce at that spot. Uh, Rashad White was a player that we knew Leonard Fournette was going to be the guy, but there were also interesting like green flags about his profile as a pass catcher coming out of Arizona State that. You know, even if he didn't score all the touchdowns, he could get some touches in a high volume offense for Tampa Bay. But we'll get to Evan Ingram here in round 15. He correlates, you know, well with Zay Jones, who comes later. Um, You know, you you had Ingram and Zay Jones go off. It was a nice little pairing, Travis Kelsey and Evan Ingram. Like, were there other reasons that you selected Ingram I mean, well, I just thought he's like a, you know, he's a horse when it comes to his mm-hmm. abilities and talent, you know, and so maybe 
he'll pop off. And then he was just a piece of the Houston Jacksonville game that I was targeting heavily over the summer. I probably would not have drafted him if I didn't have the Texans, but you know, he had all the talent in the world. It's just, you know, the giants kind of got sick of him, them and the fans and he had drops. He never really put it together, but yeah, I mean, he came up huge and he might've ended up like the tight end three for the season, all because of, you know, mostly the week that week 14 that he won me the tournament. Another thing about the rookie running backs is they pretty much all smashed. All the rookie running backs that were going before pick 140, they all smashed, as well as the rookie wide receivers. Like, pretty much every single rookie wide receiver is now going higher pick than they were last year, besides Sky Moore. And, I mean, all the rookies smashed last year, <laughs> pretty much. Like, if you just drafted a rookie, they did well for you, and except for, like, Drake London. So, I mean... Is that why you're more in on the Drake London hype train this year? I mean, dude, his underlying stats were incredible with the target shares and yards per out run. He just had a terrible quarterback. But once Ritter came in, he smashed, and his talent profile is unbelievable. So I'm huge in on London. I would say he's my favorite wide receiver. But, again, I would just draft rookies. Like, they usually smash, and the market just grades them a bit cheaper because it's uncertainty. And so if the rookie's going before pick 150 – the market realizes he has potential, but they're just uncertain about his role. I would draft as many rookies as possible. I mean, don't go overboard, but when in doubt, take a rookie. You want to leave with rookies on your team in best ball. You do, especially because we know when they spike, and that's in the second half of the season. And we were talking about Jalen Hyatt earlier. Like, this is the Jalen Hyatt corollary, right? So we're here for drafting rookies here for zero RB. We'll round it out here. We already talked about Chris Evans uh, trying to, maybe that was a regret pick with Samaji P Ryan still, still available, but it's okay. It's okay. Uh, how dare we criticize a million dollar board here? Uh, it was the so- right idea. Just the wrong <laughs> player. Like the Bengals backup smash. Just unfortunately right. not the wrong one. Absolutely. Uh, but Zay Jones, you mentioned that this was the, the game you wanted, but Jones had an interesting profile. I mean, he was a second round pick drafted by Buffalo. He had like, I don't know, like a 40% target share in college. Like I think he had like 200 targets in college, like in one season, like this is a guy who did command targets. And then he has the opportunity on an ascending Jacksonville offense. That is, you know, playing the Houston team that you wanted to correlate with, uh, yeah, was Zay Jones just a matchup pick? Oh, no. I mean, I had read a Road of His article that was, like, really compelling, talking about his, his air yards he's going to see this year and that he has, you know, high ceiling week to week for best ball and that he's going basically in the last round. So it was mostly because of that Road of His article that I was targeting him. Well, shout out to Road of His for winning yeah. King Cap a million dollars. <laughs> Hear that? <laughs> Hear that? <laughs> awesome. Uh, we talked about Davis Mills a little bit as well. He didn't contribute at all, but you did want to get a little bit into that week 17. Um, a, a couple last questions, and then we'll let you go. Yeah, um, I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, for sure. No, I'm grateful for you carving out a little bit of time, King Cap, uh, to, to chat with me about your team. Um, let's see. You mentioned you talked about zero RB as this as the strategy that you wanted to go into. You talked about tra- targeting players in particular matchups because week 17 was still in mind. Like this was not correct me if I'm wrong, but this was a team that you weren't thinking, oh, this is going to win me the million here in the regular season. <laughs> right. Definitely not. Definitely not. But I mean, dude, zero RB is just the most upside. You know, people say they, they never won like the finals in best ball, but that's because no one does it. Yeah. Like only 2% of teams before this year have been doing zero RB. And that's one of the biggest advantages of it is that it offers the most upside and it's also the most unique because people aren't doing it. And there's some conception that this year more people are doing zero RB, but it's just not true. In the last 10 best ball mania drafts I've done, I think only six or seven people out of what is that 144 did zero RB where they pushed running back to at least the sixth round. So the, the upside is, is way more than the other teams and less people are doing it. So it's a double whammy. And this year with the allure of the third round running backs, it'll be very underutilized again. Yeah. I mean, that's one thing that in the pre-show messaging back and forth, I mentioned that like, it's going to be so hard to pass up some of the, 
some of these second and third round running backs because like how can you pass up Nick Chubb or Tony Pollard like those are players that we love to see their upside and and even their floors are delicious but you know as you mentioned earlier if they don't go off you lose it's not just that like you can't just win with them you'll just lose if they don't deliver and and running back is the most volatile position so yeah, this is this is a strategy that we need to be considering more because of the results that it brings. And there's theory and theory, there's logic to the madness of of this. Uh, what might feel uncomfortable for a lot of people. So, yeah, and yeah. don't let people say, "Oh, it's another year where the finals winner was you know running back, running back, or running back, whatever." Uh, it's just because no one's doing it is why no one's winning with the finals. And that's why you want to be doing it is because no one's doing it. So I, I can't speak highly enough of, of zero RB <laughs> and I'll be having at least 70, 80% of my teams be zero RB again. All right. Well, King cap, I appreciate you jumping in with me today. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, lots of fireworks here. Lots of truth bombs being dropped. Uh, lots of yeah. July 4th fireworks for y'all. Uh, make sure you guys are following King Cap on Twitter at King Capital. Uh, any other uh, shout outs or drops that you want to make? Oh, uh, no, just good luck to everyone with best ball. And maybe you'll bring me on later in the month and we'll do a best ball draft together or something. That would be a lot of fun. I appreciate it. I know you're in Michigan, so you can get <laughs> some equity in it through my team. I would love to do a draft on here. Just thank you for the opportunity. And I'll definitely be listening to player profile throughout the year. It's entertaining stuff. <laughs> we appreciate it no it's a lot of fun make sure you guys are following king cap at king capital follow me on twitter at ff Stalder. make sure you guys are hitting that red subscribe button on the youtube channel player profiler and we've got some exciting news coming up i don't want to uh let anything out of the bag soon uh, too soon but there's some big news coming um for the best bell fantasy football podcast and live stream uh so on that note on behalf of king cap i'm bradley Till next time, good luck in the best ball streets, everybody. Hey, I want to take a moment to thank you for tuning in. It's important to me that all of our media be free. This is only possible because of you allowing a true independent sports media enterprise to thrive unlike any other in the business. So please subscribe to the All-In Package to continue to make all this possible to ensure that all of our stats, information, data, content is available to you, especially you, the people that get the site and get the show.